It's the Bitter Southerner podcast from Georgia Public Broadcasting and the magazine I edit, The Bitter Southerner. Welcome to episode five of our second season. I'm Chuck Reese, and today we take you to a place that is familiar to every Southerner, the Waffle House. This is fine. Yeah, it's Waffle House time. Yeah, we even sing about the Waffle House. When it comes to the best that not beginners, the Waffle House people, they're sure winners. Let's head for the other side. It's Waffle House time. And every Southerner has their Waffle House memories. Many are from late nights, and they might be blurry in the brain, because Waffle House is, after all, a place where the night owls go before they crawl in bed and hide from the sun. It's not a easy little place, then no to get you in and out. But if you want to take your time, hey, really don't mind, they just Many other of our Waffle House memories are from childhood because every Southern kid will be taken to a Waffle House at some point. It took about five seconds for us to see this phenomenon one more time on the day we walked into Waffle House store number 1000 in Avondale Estates, Georgia with a bag full of microphones. You want to answer some questions about the Waffle House? This is Samantha Nyack and her daughter, Annika. Well, she's only four, so she's been coming for four years, and I've been coming for as long as I have memories. Sam lives around the corner from the very first Waffle House. It's now a museum, and it's just down the block from the store that we're in today. She says coming here brings back memories from when she was a kid. Our waitress was always Trina, and one time she let me go behind the counter and work the griddle and make my own egg and cheese sandwich and one time a manager was there and he was so entertained by us he gave us like a full set of dishes to take home and I still have them (laughs) and I used to collect menus from Waffle Houses around the country on road trips like or anytime they came out with a new menu I would ask if I could take it home. And she's now passing those special Waffle House moments on to her own children. But little Annika, she's kind of busy right now. What's your favorite thing to eat here? Waffles. I need napkins. She and her brother both have it memorized. They napkins. Always share the All Star Special, or I share it with them. (laughs) Napkins. Will somebody please get this girl some napkins so she can finish her meal? Do you want to say you can't live without hash browns? That's I like can't live without hash browns. Do it without your hand in front of your mouth. I can't live without hash browns. It is indeed hard to live without hash browns. And you know, there's so many Waffle Houses spread across the South that government officials use whether they're open or not as an indicator of how severe any natural disaster down here is. The Federal Emergency Management Agency actually has a thing called the Waffle House Index. It was created by former FEMA Administrator Craig Fugate. Listen to him explain it from a 2016 episode of the NPR game show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. They are open most of the time, and that was the index. If a Waffle House is closed because of a disaster, it's bad, we call it red. If they're open but have a limited menu, that's (laughs) yellow because they've lost power. The index isn't just funny, it works, because most Southerners will tell you that they depend on their neighborhood Waffle House when Mother Nature throws life sideways. Which raises a bigger question. The kind of question the bitter Southerner just loves to dig into. How is it possible for a 2,000-store restaurant chain to become, in the eyes of almost all Southerners, something more than just another anonymous place to eat? Why do Southern families believe it actually matters that they take their kids to a Waffle House? I mean, nobody down here thinks that way about the neighborhood Applebee's. And a man you will meet in a moment put the question this way. How can a cookie-cutter restaurant chain 
win over the hearts of millions of people. Well, like most things in our region, it's complicated. But we think we have some answers for you. So today on the Bitter Southerner podcast, The Ways of the Waffle House. The man I just mentioned is named Micah Cash, and we would not be having this conversation at all had he not called me with an idea back in 2018. Micah is a photographer based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and way back when, when the Bitter Southerner was just a baby, he was among the first shooters to contribute a big photo essay, visual journalism, as they say, to the Bitter Southerner. Micah's the kind of journalist that any magazine editor loves because he picks a big topic and he gets fascinated, maybe even obsessed with it, for a long time. Folks like that always tell great stories, and Micah began telling such stories with his photographs for The Bitter Southerner four years ago. And in 2018, Micah Cash called me with a grand idea. He wanted to visit waffle houses all over the South with his camera, living by a strict set of rules. At every single Waffle House, he would sit down and order a meal and then shoot photographs only from where he sat and focused only on what he could see through the big plate glass windows. He said this exercise would teach us something important about the daily life of Southerners. Sixty-odd Waffle Houses and several months later, he came back with the goods, which we published under the headline Waffle House Vistas, on March 12th, 2019. I went uh, throughout the Deep South, so Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas, Florida. And what did Micah find at Waffle Houses all over the South? In many respects, Waffle House is not remarkable. Right, and I don't think it's meant to be. It's, I mean, eggs are eggs, bacon is bacon. It's meant to come out quick. It's meant to come out and taste good. It's meant to be consistent every time. It's meant to give you what you came there for. Micah's own rules were equally consistent. I wanted the viewer to know immediately of what you see, the booth, the screens, the coffee mugs, that I was in a Waffle House. When I'm feeling kind of hungry, be it morning, noon, or night, I just pull into the Waffle House. They always treat me right. Find my favorite table, the booth is nice and wide, and I always order hash browns because they make a tasty side. Sometimes I like it immediately re- leads toward the lived experience that all of us have with Waffle House, and then it forces the viewer with all of that lived experience to then look out the restaurant and witness um, the world that we actually live in. Chili, 57 on my pie, now that'll raise the eyebrows of the people walking by. Yum. Photographing the world outside of a Waffle House was a conversation starter. You don't necessarily look at your server or look at somebody in the booth next to you and say, hey, where are you from? Um, But when you are an artist and you're sitting in a Waffle House and you pull out a camera and you start photographing the parking lot, (laughs) then people start to be like, "What, what are you doing? And so, you know, you tell them what you do and then they think about it. And then it opens that door to have those conversations about, well, let me tell you how long I've worked at a Waffle House or let me tell you I'm going to school and this is my lifelong dream to do this. And they came up in in a way that was safe over food. And that was the answer. Just sit right here. My name is Kate. I'll be glad to take your order now. How about a steak? It may be the one place that's common to the entire South where you can happen into a conversation with just anybody regardless of their race, place, or station, that's a Waffle House. And Micah's photos and words became the most widely read story of 2019 for us. So popular, in fact, that in December, we wound up turning it into a book, like a real book, the kind you can spread out on your lap. Now, you could stop right here and buy that book and be done with it, but I think the job of this podcast is to dive into how and why Waffle House became such a place. Those are the stories that you won't find in Micah's book, but you will find them here right after this break. This is the Bitter Southerner podcast from Georgia Public Broadcasting. you to know. 
when you come in each day with a big yellow sign stand so tall that we're going to give you the best that we've got because we're going to give it our all. We're going to push, push, till everything is just right. Push, push. Welcome back to the Bitter Southerner podcast. We're talking on this episode about Waffle House. Now, the first thing you need to know about Waffle House is that it is run very differently than your typical big corporation. And I do know a thing or two about big corporations because in the middle part of my career, I wrote stuff for quite a lot of them. Waffle House's management structure, top to bottom, is completely uncommon. Every executive in the management of those little diners, all the way up to executive VPs, people you would expect to have grand offices at headquarters, None of those people even has an office. Every single meeting, all their business, it's done inside a Waffle House somewhere as the customers eat their meals around them. And the company just generally looks at the world differently. Dip, 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 dip. You see, I never heard these folks ever once mention the phrase market segment because there are no segments. Everybody, anybody, is a customer. And treating everyone who walks into Waffle House as equals comes from the two men who started the thing back in 1955. Way back in the 50s, so long ago, there were two dreamers, their names Tom and Joe. They built a business, a business to Work their motto, good food, fast, waffle house. Tom Fortner and Joe Rogers Sr. had a dream, a simple restaurant for the people. He said, uh, you build a restaurant and I'll show you how to run it. And we built a little place called Waffle House. The first voice you heard was Tom's, followed by Joe's. Joe said the makeup of the restaurant and its menu were not at all complicated. Plans consisted of one page, and 14 stools, stainless steel back bar. My brother built it and leased it to us, and I think the rent was $150 a month, and we didn't know whether we could pay that or not. But it was a good design. On Labor Day 1955, Joe and Tom opened the first Waffle House restaurant in Avondale Estates, Georgia. You could get a waffle with two eggs for 75 cents, a char burger for 40 cents, a filet mignon for a buck fifty. You could buy a whole pie for a dollar twenty-five, and all of this was available twenty-four hours a day because, as Tom Fortner once wisely noted, working people are out there twenty-four hours a day. With me, I I'd always have the opinion that people went to sleep at night. The milkman's out, the newspaper delivery men out, and just people go and come all twenty-four hours a day. And even as Waffle House grew, their focus on hospitality never waned. Joe Rogers Sr. always put it above everything else. We need to kill them with kindness. We need to let them know how much we appreciate it. We need to let the Waffle House be their home away from home. They kept going through the 60s, now 70s. Joe Sr. died in March of 2017, and Tom Fortner followed him to the great beyond only a month later. And their very first diner is now a museum, and it's the only Waffle House anywhere that's open by appointment only. But if you're ever in Avondale Estates, you ought to think about scheduling a visit. Somebody from Waffle House will come and take you through it. It is a fine way to spend an hour. Back in the Waffle House where Avondale Estates people still eat, Gabrielle Garrett is cooking some hash browns on the flat top grill. (laughs) 
when we met her, Gabrielle had only been working at Waffle House for about four months, but she told us that one of her favorite dishes to make actually isn't on the menu. Well, my favorite thing to make is, it's very simple, a raisin grilled cheese. It's like a, a sweet and salty type feel to it, so it's something different, basically. But if I had to choose with something that's on the menu, I like making the hash brown bowls. The hash brown bowls and the grit bowls and everything else. And that isn't a surprise if you knew what Gabrielle used to order from Waffle House when she was a kid. She talked with our producer, Sean Powers. I would normally order a hash brown with some grits, because I don't eat eggs. So, yeah. And what are you making right now? <laughs> I'm making a scrambled egg plate. <laughs> Gabrielle Garrett has been with Waffle House for less than a year, but she's got big dreams. She wants to rise from grill cook to executive. You say, what? Well, the weird thing is that dreams like hers actually do come true at Waffle House, and often. Because if you get in their management training program, the first thing you're going to do is start in a restaurant. You're going to cook. You're going to serve. You're going to clean the bathrooms. And Vikas Miller went into that program three decades ago, and now he's an executive vice president at Waffle House, which means that he's responsible for more than 200 stores, more or less 10% of all the Waffle Houses. He has no office, of course, but he's got a car he puts a lot of miles on, traveling from store to store to store across Georgia and Tennessee. And you know, every Waffle House employee's name tag also lists where they were born. And one of the first things I noticed when I met Vikas Miller was his name tag says Bronx, New York. It's a perfect icebreaker. So when I'm walking, talking to the customers in the restaurant, they say, I didn't know we have a Waffle House in the Bronx. I said, no, I'm not from the Bronx. And that's that. And then we have a conversation about the Bronx, how I got down here, and we just start talking about it. So it it's, it's usually makes pretty good conversation. Now, Vikas first moved to Georgia for the same reason that many of our nation's most talented African-American men come here to attend Morehouse College in Atlanta. He was an entrepreneur from the start. Right after his graduation, he opened a few restaurants and dry cleaners near Morehouse and the city's other historically black colleges and universities. But his location had both advantages and disadvantages. When the students were in session, business was great. When students went home for vacations and, and over the summertime, there was no business. Right. And, and my wife, she uh, was like, I'm tired of it. the money going up and down. And, and so she, as a joke, um, she put my resume out there and somebody from Waffle House called me. Are you serious? I am absolutely. So we, she did it without telling you? Yeah, she did without telling me. And, <laughs> Yeah, and so I give all credit to her. Um, she's the reason for my success, besides her being a fabulous woman. You know, she is, uh, she put my resume out there. I, I got a phone call, and at the time, I was, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm like, I really don't need to go and, and, and work for somebody else. I have my own business. Right. But one thing I've always wanted to do is just kind of learn about other businesses you know as you entrepreneur it's always good for you to learn about it so I came to Waffle House and 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 talked to a Derek Cooper who was my first um, division manager mm. and the things that really interest me about Waffle House was that we're all homegrown so we all yeah. start doesn't matter what you've done in your previous life mm -hmm. everybody that comes into the management program starts as a manager training um, and the, at one at, at restaurant. One, at, at, yes, at one restaurant. Wow. So we'll start training. You know, you, the training program is about three months, and then after you graduate from what we call Wu or Waffle House University, then you are checked into a one-store restaurant, and you're a unit manager. The next stage after a unit manager is a district manager, which is normally two to three restaurants that you run. So I was a unit manager for a year. 
I was a district manager for a year and a half. Uh -huh. The next stage after being a district is a division manager, which you have nine stores that you're responsible for. Okay. And I was a division manager for four and a half years. Uh -huh. Um, and then the next step after that is an area manager, which is about 27 stores. So we kind of go in threes. So it's one store, three store, nine stores, 27 stores. And then the next stage after that is a senior vice president, which is about 75 stores. And now you're an exec VP, so how many is that? So I have, I'm responsible for 230 restaurants and also responsible for 56. Um, we have um, about 300, roughly 300 franchises. And so responsible have uh, about 56 franchises that I'm also responsible for. And those are in Atlanta, roughly 150 stores or so in Atlanta. And the rest are in actually Middle Tennessee, Nashville, Murfreesboro, mm -hmm. Knoxville, and Chattanooga. Right, right. Yeah. So you're all over the place. All over the place. When you reach the level and you've got 200 plus stores to look after. Sure. Like, how many of those do you wind up being in physically every year on average? My goal is to at least step into one of my each one of my restaurants a minimum one time a year. And the interesting thing, what people really don't understand is that obviously we're open 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that we're responsible 24 hours. So we actually can show up in the restaurants on second shifts. Right. And we also show up on third shifts. Now, Vikas and I talked for a while about incidents that have happened inside Waffle Houses that make the news now and then. Some of them including racially motivated violence or allegations of police brutality. Now, when that happens in one of his stores, Vikas is the person who has to handle it because that's his job. And to do that, he says, you got to keep one thing in mind, that people are people. Every one of them is different. Everyone has his or her own concerns. You have good black people, bad black people. You have good white people, bad, bad white, white people. people. You have good everybody, bad everybody. So it's not a matter about race or anything like that. It's about treating people the way you want to be treated and, and respecting people and, and people striving towards some common goals. And, and that was the beautiful thing that I loved about the South. And that's one of the things I love about Waffle House. It's like we are all like equal. You know, I may have a title of an executive vice president, but at the end of the day, I'll come in and I'll sweep. You know, I'll cook, I'll clean the bathrooms, I pick up trash outside, and, and I don't feel like I'm any better than any of our people that are working in any particular store. We're just all one family. So, now that you've learned about the business part, let's learn about the culture part. Point number one. The ways of the Waffle House are so universal in the South that they have become part of the way we talk, our lexicon. This is particularly true when it comes to hash browns. The standard Waffle House breakfast, if you don't want a waffle, that is, offers the usual choices of meat, egg cooking method, and toast options, and you can choose between grits or hash browns. Now, Waffle House hash browns are seasoned potatoes scattered on a hot flat top grill and browned to perfection on both sides. One may also order them to be smothered with onions and covered in cheese. Scattered, smothered, and covered. It's a phrase that every single Southerner knows, regardless of how they like their hash browns. So let's say, for instance, that two young Southerners, let's say they're in college, they wake up one morning with hangover. One asks the other, how you feeling? If the other one said, scattered, smothered, and covered, that would be a perfectly acceptable response. Now the ways of Waffle House are now just part of how we talk. Now I did, however, learn from Vikas Miller that the list of what a Waffle House will do for your hash browns went far longer than even I knew. In addition to the standard three, scattered, smothered, and covered. You may also order your hash browns peppered with jalapenos, chunked with pieces of ham, diced, that is diced tomatoes, topped with chili, and country, meaning that it's topped with cream gravy. Wow, one day I'm gonna try all that together. Culture point number two is the music. Raisin 
all through this episode, you've been hearing songs about Waffle House, and that is no accident. Raisin toast at Waffle House. There is a record label that is called Waffle House Records. The menu over well decided what to eat. Out came one little geyser with the knee and said, Be sure to choose the raisin toast and popped into the bread. We sang out. Now, that song, which is called There Are Raisins in My Toast, is one of the tracks released by Waffle House's record label. Nadine Gillespie is the president of that label, which currently has about 50 Waffle House-themed songs. You can hear these songs online, or you can hear them as intended on the jukeboxes at Waffle Houses all over the South and elsewhere. But Nadine says they never end up on the radio and they're not advertised. It's about the Waffle House experience, so it's meant to kind of enhance that experience versus, you know, making a commercial venture out of the record label. Now, the idea to make Waffle House music was the brainchild of company co-founder Joe Rogers Sr. And Nadine says there are one or two songs added to the record label every single year. One of the most recent songs we wrote was, um, I think it's called Only at the Waffle House. It's where people party on their birthday. talks about the different funny things that happen at Waffle House, like somebody giving birth at Waffle House or, you know, somebody riding their horse to the Waffle House. Or even saddle up. We've got a place for your horse, of course. We We have those kinds of stories that come out in the songs or just about the experience in general. As she looks ahead, Nadine wants to broaden the genres of music that Waffle House music covers by adding more country tracks, maybe reaching out to more established artists. Well, we decided that we wanted to catch up with one of the earliest Waffle House performers who, back in the late 1980s and early 90s, first added her voice to the catalog. My name is Alfreda Gerald, and I'm one of the featured singers that you may hear on the Waffle House jukeboxes around the country. When I walk into a Waffle House, the first thing I do is look for the jukebox. I get a quarter, or however much it is now, (laughs) and I go and play myself on uh, the jukebox. Uh, The song I usually play is I Feel Good at the Waffle House. Yeah. Uh. (laughs) Oh, yes, I remember this. young then <laughs> I arranged the melody and the vocals on I feel good at the Waffle House it's inspired uh, from the works of Mariah Carey and Janet Jackson has those influences in the song it happens every time this like it was yesterday now. I have not heard it in its entirety probably in 30 years. One night I got caught in the storm. I needed somewhere nice and warm. And through the darkness of the night, I could see... When I was thinking about this, I was just trying to come up with a melody line that was up with the times at that time. But I liked the hook. I feel good at the Waffle House because it's very, very catchy. And after the song goes off, everyone is always going, I feel good at the Waffle House. And so I thought that that was catchy. I feel good. It happens every time. I feel good. Just find the yellow sign. Those 
Those background vocals sound really good. What? I wanted it to be a hit. It was going to be on Waffle House Radio, and they had a, a different aspirations for this back in the day. They didn't know where it was going to even, maybe it might blow up and become something. Um, but I really wanted it to go down in history just like it has. A lot of songs were cut that you don't hear of anymore. They didn't make it. But I feel good at the Waffle House, and several of the ones that you probably will play uh, were popular enough to withstand the test of time. And that was my uh, goal. Happens every time, every time I look for the yellow sign. <laughs> Woo! Oh my goodness. <laughs> now that really brought back memories. The next song is They're Cooking Up My Order, number one. <laughs> I took them to church on this one. <laughs> Just want a big bowl of grits after hearing that. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right now. They don't really give us these songs ahead of time. You just walk in and you learn it on the spot. The music starts, and that's right down my alley. I know instinctively what to do. So as soon as the music started, I knew what to do, and I loved it because it really made me want to go to the Waffle House, first of all. And it was down-home Southern. It's just as, as Southern gospel, I think, as you can get this song. to me. Ooh, yeah. When I was thinking of this song, I could just see them cooking up my order. Uh, and that it was going to be grits and country ham and biscuits. And not even a waffle. I don't think waffle is uh, as country as as a biscuit. But uh, I loved it. These songs have, as you already know, have withstood the test of time. Way more than a lot of famous artists that we know. So, you know, my voice has been heard for 30 years and will be heard for 30 more years when a lot of people won't. So in, in, in essence, I am a star and I'm a star at the Waffle House. That's Georgia singer Alfreda Gerald, one of the many artists to lend her voice to the Waffle House record label. And you can hear more Waffle House songs on our website. And so there you have the proof. The Waffle House is so important to Southerners that we A, use its grill cook lingo in our everyday speech, and that B, some of our musicians are perfectly happy to write catchy little numbers about raisin toast or hash browns. But the most important thing is still what happens inside a Waffle House. Micah Cash wrote about it this way. Waffle House does not care how much you are worth, what you look like, where you are from, what your political beliefs are, or where you've been, so long as you respect the unwritten rules of Waffle House. Be kind, 
be respectful, and don't overstay when others are waiting for a table. Now, when we decided to turn Micah's story into a book, we wondered who might write a perfect foreword for it. I began thinking of a New Orleans novelist and bitter Southerner contributor named Maurice Carlos Ruffin. Maurice's debut novel last year, We Cast a Shadow, is just stunningly good reading, and I do recommend that you buy it. But when I asked Maurice if he'd be interested in this Waffle House project, I was surprised that he said yes immediately. No hesitation whatsoever. Now, a couple of days before I sat down with Vicus Miller at the Waffle House in Avondale Estates, Maurice had sent me the first draft of that forward. And, bless his heart, he agreed to join us from New Orleans to read the first two paragraphs of it for you. The South is my home. The South's people are my people. The South's places are my places. But when I travel to new towns from Louisiana to Virginia, I always take care when I walk into an unfamiliar establishment, especially restaurants. I'm not looking for trouble. And I don't expect special treatment, but I do expect normal treatment. I don't always get normal treatment. I've entered a restaurant only to have the white employee stare at me until another white person broke the silence. I've been seated by the bathroom or garbage can despite the availability of open tables near bright plate glass windows. Once, while sitting with two out-of-town friends who kept staring over my shoulder, they brought to my attention a painting on the wall, a painting of an enslaved woman preparing food. The painting was made to evoke nostalgia for a better time that never existed, but it made me feel sick. I've never felt sick in a Waffle House. I've eaten in Waffle Houses all over the South. I've eaten in Waffle Houses at sunrise and in the heat of the night. When I was at a writing conference in Fairhope, Alabama a few years ago, a friend suggested we go find a late breakfast in town. My friend, she was Jewish, and we laughed at a black man and Jewish woman walking into a diner in the Deep South, sounding like a great setup for a funny joke. But there was no joke. We went. We were greeted, seated, and served. I had a crispy waffle swimming in syrup with a side of ham. I left with a full belly and a smile on my face, just like anybody. That's the experience I've had every time I've gone to a Waffle House, and that's as it should be. Our thanks to Maurice Ruffin for sharing his perspective on Waffle House. And you know, when I went to see Vicus Miller that day, I took Maurice's essay with me. I found myself wanting to read it to Vicus because I felt like it got to the heart of what he himself had been telling me, what he believed about the company he'd worked for across three decades. And I just wanted to see what he would say when he heard those words. It makes me feel good that the company I work for, that a person can feel like that. Right. Um, it just it just goes to the things that we actually believe in, that people get it and they see it and they feel it, you know, and that's that's the beauty of, of this company. So, I, 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 you know, you can't buy better words, you know, than what he wrote. You know, that's, that's perfect. And, you know, when you look at why we don't advertise, you know, that's our advertisement. We treat people right when they come in. We treat every single customer the same way. And, and, and people recognize that and they keep coming back. And so, I mean, that's beautiful. And that's it for us today, y'all. Our producer, Sean Powers, juggles orders at the flat top. Our editor, Josephine Bennett, makes sure our customers hear our stories as they should be heard, just like you ordered them. And on this show's episode page at bittersouthern.com, we posted links to where you can read Micah Cash's original photo essay and a link to where you can buy your very own copy of Waffle House Vistas, the book published by BS Publishing. Our sincerest thanks go out to Micah Cash for starting this whole adventure, to Maurice Ruffin and a North Carolina writer, Laura Bullard, a member of the Lumbee Nation, for contributing their words to this book. 
And a huge thank you to Pat Warner of Waffle House, who so graciously introduced us to good people like Vikas Miller, gave us permission to use all this Waffle House music, gave us access to recorded interviews with the company's co-founders, Joe Rogers Sr. and Tom Fortner, and finally for giving us a sweet personal tour of the Waffle House Museum in downtown Avondale Estates, Georgia. I am blessed to have many talented friends, and I always thank one of them, Patterson Hood, for allowing us to use his Ever South as our theme song and its performance by his truly badass band, Drive-By Truckers. If you like the Bitter Southerner podcast, y'all need to review it and rate it on Apple Podcasts. Even if you listen to it somewhere else, please, please, pretty please do that because those reviews help us so much. Our show is a co-production of Georgia Public Broadcasting and the Bitter Southerner Magazine. You can access more from each episode at gpb.org slash podcasts. I'm Chuck Reese, and my three instructions remain constant. Hug more necks, abide no hatred, and spend your time doing what you love with who you love. And you can, 24-7, do that at a Waffle House. See y'all in two weeks. <laughs>